Um, I'd like to begin by acknowledging the traditional owners of this land and pay my respects to the elders past and present. I'd also like to say what an honor it is to share the podium with Dr. Ann O'Neill. It's quite a powerful presentation. Um, I want to thank the organizers for inviting me to come and speak to you about um, programs in Canada and also thank them for their generosity letting me come and attend the entire conference um, because I've had an opportunity to learn so much just in the very first day. Um, I've been in Australia since mid-September. I'm on sabbatical and whenever I'm on sabbatical I immediately head to Australia. Um, and I've had the benefit of traveling to a number of communities and cities uh, around your beautiful country and <coughs> learning from service providers and researchers uh, in different communities about the challenges they face and the issues they confront um, providing services for victims of domestic violence. Um, last week I was in Darwin and um, I was struck by how similar the circumstances for Aboriginal women are in, in Australia and in Canada. And yesterday I heard an outstanding presentation by members of the Waringa Baya uh, uh, Aboriginal Women's Legal Clinic uh, that reinforced my perceptions that um, the issues that we face in Canada are very, very similar to the issues that you face in Australia. As we all know, unfortunately, domestic violence is universal. Whether I am in Beijing, the United Kingdom, the Caribbean, or Canada, I am always finding stunningly similar stories. On the bright side, um, wherever I am, and I've had the privilege to be in many countries, I have always been struck by the similarity of the victim advocates. Their passion, their commitment, and their dogged determination. They don't give up. They want to change the system. They want to give victims voice and make their homes and their worlds safer. Despite all of these remarkably similar patterns in domestic violence around the world, I've come to understand that while the patterns of abuse are similar, the solutions um, will be different in different communities because of the different resources, the different capacities, and the different cultures in each country and each community. So my presentation today is about how some of the cities and provinces in Canada have come to select court specialization as one strategy uh, to try to create a more sensitive and respectful response in the criminal justice system to victims of domestic violence and to help them build safer lives for themselves and their children. So uh, what I have to offer here today is simply an example, a discussion point, um, and I understand I'm making no assumptions that this might be applicable to your community. However, I do know that there are some remarkably successful specialized court programs in Australia, um, and I'm particularly familiar with the program in Canberra. Um, I'm going to present a little history of how we came to this choice and then I'll present a, a, just a little bit of data from the Family Violence Court and also from the, um, the Healing Journey study that we did where we asked women what their experiences of the court was. To begin, I just would like to quote um, figures provided by a Canadian journalist by the name of Brian Valley. And what he did was he looked at the total war and police casualties in Canada and the United States, and he compared them to the total female domestic violence homicide victims in Canada and the United States. And I think this is a very important slide because what it tells us 
and I think Australia is very similar to Canada. When a soldier is killed in Afghanistan, the, it is headline news across the country. Our Prime Minister goes to their funerals. We're all aware of it. When a woman is killed by her husband, it might make page three on the local newspaper. And so I think it's always important to remind ourselves that we need to be aware and we need to remind people that we're working in a field that is very, very volatile and dangerous and we need to be extremely respectful of what the families of um, victims of domestic violence are dealing with and what the, the victims in many cases who come to the courts. So our job, all of our jobs, is to try, try to prevent these casualties. Okay, how were victims and offenders dealt with before uh, court specialization? Well, in Canada, police seldom charged. Um, they tried informal dispute resolution, and we really had a double standard. And this was this was a like bef in the early 80s. Um, if you hit a stranger, it was a crime, and you could be arrested. If you hit a family member, it was a personal tragedy, and you should go get counseling. So there was not a, an effective intervention uh, by the police. Prosecutors had few cases because, of the course, the police were not responding and they weren't arresting. And they didn't like to deal with them. Um, there was, there is within the criminal justice system, generally, a presumption that victims should have the same goals as prosecutors. But they don't. Um, prosecutors are trained to get successful convictions. That may not be at all what the victim wants in uh, seeking intervention and help. So prosecutors were incredibly frustrated. They, um, they hated having domestics and so before specialization what would happen is the senior crown would handle it to the less experienced crown who would handle it off to the least experienced crown because nobody wanted these files because they could never be in their definition successful. It was very hard to get a conviction. Victims were reluctant and um, it didn't meet their concept of what would be a good case to take to court. Judges saw even fewer cases because Crown prosecutors were reluctant to proceed. Uh, they, as a result, uh, there were very few convictions. And even in those circumstances where there, those rare circumstances where there were convictions, the sentences were, were very light and really inappropriate to the nature of the assault that had occurred. I've been doing this work now since 1983, and I used to sit in court in 1983 <laughs> and record what would happen. And the most frequent disposition for an offender who was convicted of serious assault was conditional discharge. I don't know if you have that in Australia, but what that means in Canada is uh, no criminal record, no punishment, no treatment, and if you don't reoffend within 12 months, no consequences at all. So it, there was really a message from the bench that it wasn't very nice, but really there were no consequences. So the very first reform that took place in the early 80s was a directive to the police to charge if evidence of a crime existed regardless of the relationship between the victim and the accused. This reform was actually very, very important because for the first time you had official statistics that could support what the service providers had been telling us for years, that it's a pervasive problem, that it's a, it's a endemic in our society. What happened with arrests is more cases came to court, court reporters started to cover these cases, and so the next stage in development began, and that was the dissatisfaction on the part of reporters and consequently the community that when these cases did get to court, they were not being treated seriously. 
they were not getting um, the kinds of consequences or interventions that would be helpful. This is, um, this is a quote from a colleague of mine in Ontario based on a, a, a tragic familicide in, in Ontario. And what this event provoked, and I think this shows that while the media is sometimes your worst enemy, it can also sometimes be your best friend. What the Toronto Star did, which I thought was absolutely brilliant, is they took a hundred cases that occurred in one week in Toronto and they followed them through that whole process, which was nine, ten months later. And what they revealed was that there were very little meaningful interventions. Most of the cases were dropped um, and, and that the consequences were not helpful um, and, and did not reflect the seriousness of crimes. As a result of this, the public in North America began to be very concerned about the ability of our traditional courts to respond. Also, the practitioners were becoming very unhappy with the traditional court. And I've, I've chosen a quote from an American judge because Canadian judges aren't quite as outspoken. And, and this is uh, Justice <coughs> Kathleen Blatt's talking about the introduction of treatment courts, specialized treatment courts. And she says, I think the innovation that we're seeing now is the result of judges processing cases like a vegetable factory. Instead of cans of peas, you've got cases. You just move them, move them, move them, move them. One of my colleagues on the bench said, you know, I feel like I work for McJustice. We sure aren't good for you, but we're fast. And so you had developing across North America different levels of pressure. The media kept the pressure on the ministers because they had to answer the questions in the House from opposition, who always like a good scandalous um, newspaper headline. The, the public were lobbying from the grassroots uh, to the political uh, decision makers because they were reading these stories in the press and they were dissatisfied and increasingly practitioners, certainly not all but many, were feeling dissatisfied with the quality of justice they could provide and wanted a better model, a better strategy so that their interventions could be meaningful. <coughs> 